families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Families Divided TV. Tonight, Dean Tong is our guest, and he's going to be speaking to us on a very important, hot topic when CPS knocks on your door. This episode is intended for attorneys who represent clients in juvenile court and parents accused of child abuse, neglect, and or abandonment. Mr. Tong affords the audience sage advice from his nearly four decades of personal and professional experience as an expert in court. He's going to be speaking to us from how CPS has simulated its BM of power to capture, to conducting minimal facts interviews with alleged child victims of abuse, to a definitional simulation of false versus unsubstantiated allegations, to juvenile and administrative functioning and processing of cases when CPS takes your kids. Mr. Tom passionately delivers a powerful fat field expose on child protective services. And this is a fact. So you really, really want to pay attention. This is a great episode. It's like I said, chunk full of much advice and information. And I hope you get a lot out of it. I'm sure you will if you're in this situation. We're going to bring Dean Tong back with us right after these important messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. Good evening, Dean Tong here. I am uh, going to be talking to you about when CPS knocks on your door. I want to thank uh, Elaine Cobb and Families Divided TV for having me once again. Uh, their website is familyaccessfightingforchildrensrights.com. Uh, it's a long website address, but again, Family Access fightingforchildrensrights.com. Um, I want to extend my prayers and condolences to uh, Israel and the state of Maine for the atrocities that has occurred, uh, have occurred uh, in those regions of our uh, of our planet. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, peace and tranquility and healing uh, engulf those regions as well as the entire world. All right, so CPS, uh, as you all know, is Child Protective Services. Uh, to give you a little history, um, it goes back to about 1974, about 50 years ago, and the adoption of what became known as the CAPTA, or Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, also known as the Mondale Act, named after former Vice President Walter Mondale. And that's a federal law, and that gave CPS the power to investigate uh, allegations of child abuse, child neglect, child abandonment, uh, to do so anonymously based on anonymous calls and reports to toll-free hotlines like the one in my state of Florida, 1-800-96-ABUSE, and to basically have total immunity uh, so you cannot sue the state for uh, money damages in federal court because they possess 11th Amendment immunity. You could possibly, uh, if you win your case, uh, come back and sue the individual caseworkers for professional negligence 
but not the state. CPS is a state agency. So they live under the umbrella of immunity. <clears throat> um, they developed what we what was be called uh, what came to be called uh, NCANS, the National Center for uh, Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. And they publish a peer-reviewed journal article titled Child, Child Maltreatment, which uh, was, I believe, still is edited by uh, Dr. David Finkelhor uh, from New Hampshire, Durham, New Hampshire. And that's an excellent uh, journal that comes out. Uh, the statistics for child abuse for the country are published two years uh, after the fact. So in other words, uh, data for this year, 2023, won't be available till June of 2025. <clears throat> okay, so if CPS knocks on your door, obviously uh, it can be an unbearable, unthinkable situation. What do you do? Well, uh, perhaps you had an issue before in your life and you, you, you had to contact a criminal defense attorney and the lawyer told you never speak to the police. Well, same thing here. Do not speak to uh, CPS without an attorney present. So if they're knocking on your door, you're not going to have time to, to get a lawyer, obviously, uh, unless you uh, live with an attorney. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you have a right under the castle doctrine where your home is your castle. They cannot enter your home without a warrant signed by a judge. Uh, you ask them kindly to leave their business card under your door or under your front doormat. Uh, obviously, they're there uh, perhaps on a call from a teacher or an angry uh, family member or friend. Uh, uh, it could be physical abuse. It could be sexual abuse. It could be uh, what used to be called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, now called factitious disorder imposed upon another, where one of the parents is accused of making the child sick to gain attention. Uh, it could be uh, coercive control. Uh, where there might be domestic violence in the home and the child uh, in the home is a witness, a proxy witness to domestic violence, allegedly. Uh, could be failure to protect, failure to thrive. It could be shaken baby syndrome. Uh, could be uh, an asundry of things. So this is a uh, child protective services system. Uh, obviously, they uh, are there to protect the child, not you, the family. Uh, the laws that protect CPS work in the best interest of the child, not your best interest, the accused. <clears throat> if your child uh, uh, is allowed to be talked to, so in other words, if you allow CPS to come in and talk to the child, uh, the police may or may not be there with CPS. They will talk to that child alone or in another room. If the child implicates you in a bad private part touch or the child is seen with bruises or welts or marks. Uh, they're going to escort that child out. They're going to take that child. Uh, in my state of Florida, uh, the state has 24 hours to bring it to at what's called a shelter hearing. They'll have to file a shelter petition through CPS's attorney. Uh, obviously, uh, the accused uh, will be notified, and you'll have to... Uh, go to court, and if you don't have the resources to hire a juvenile court attorney who practices what we call dependency, TPR, termination of parental rights law, you will be appointed an attorney. Uh, but this is not a lawyer of your choice. This is a lawyer the judge will just choose. So that may be uh, somebody who is a litigator who is willing to uh, contest the allegations uh, against the accused and go to court to a hearing to uh, basically uh, allow you your right to due process, or it could be a mediator and somebody who is going to uh, induce you or uh, coax you to consent to dependency, meaning that you're admitting to the abuse or neglect, but uh, in a quid pro quo, meaning the state's going to scratch your back, the judge may scratch your back as well. You scratch theirs by admitting to the abuse or neglect, uh, and they'll uh, give your child back. <clears throat> well, that could happen. That may not happen. So I don't know that I would put a lot of stock in what CPS tells you. Uh, they can threaten you. They can intimidate you. That has happened in cases of mine. Uh, but obviously, if you can, you want to retain the services of a competent uh, defense lawyer. 
uh, who has a successful track record in going up against CPS. Uh, now, uh, if it's an allegation of physical abuse or sexual abuse and it lacks physical evidence, which many cases do so, in fact, most cases of sexual abuse do so, only about 5% are going to contain medical traumatic findings uh, corroborated by a sane nurse, sexual abuse nurse examiner, or physician. Uh, most of these cases are going to come down the road. Uh, you're going to be accused of uh, abuse by hearsay meaning uh, hearsay is not a court statement made for the truth of the matter asserted. Generally speaking, it's not admissible. It is so here. This is the exception of the hearsay rule. So a uh, child makes a sexual abuse outcry or disclosure. A uh, child tells a therapist. child tells a teacher. A uh, child tells a CPS worker uh, who does a minimal facts interview, 10 or 15 minute interview with that child or the police officer does the same. Uh, you know, that's basically the exception to the hearsay rule. In most states, that's rule 803. In my state of Florida, it's known as the 23rd exception to the hearsay rule, Florida statute 90.803 uh, in parens 23. Uh, oftentimes, uh, at least in my cases, the child uh, will have a second interview, the formal, what we call forensic interview, so CPS will escort that child. Uh, the police will escort that child, perhaps, uh, and or CPS. Usually it's CPS. Uh, sometimes if it's uh, out of a custody battle, the perhaps the mother, uh, if the mother is behind the child making the allegations, may uh, escort the child to the forensic interview, the Child Advocacy Center to conduct that forensic interview. Uh, but oftentimes it is CPS who transports the child to the child advocacy center to conduct that forensic interview. That forensic interview will be captured on DVD. Uh, it'll be observed by a police officer. Uh, uh, if it's a sex case, a sex crime detective uh, and a uh, child protective investigator from CPS in an observation room uh, while the uh, certified interviewer is conducting the uh, interview with the child. <clears throat> I am nationally certified as a child forensic interviewer for the defense. I don't work for the state, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you want to, if you're going to hire an expert, you want to get a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, or someone like myself who uh, has uh, experience in reviewing, critiquing, uh, and opining uh, on the evidence-based best practices of child forensic interviews. Uh, in most states, they use semi-structured methodology. Uh, the best practice methodology is called the NICHD. That's the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, uh, developed out of Bethesda, Maryland, uh, part of the NIH, National, National Institutes of Health. And I worked a lot of cases with Dr. Phil Esplin. Dr. Esplin uh, was the co-author co -author of the original NICHD method, which was uh, developed in 2000, along with Dr. Michael Lamb and a few other psychologists uh, Dr. Esplin was also co-author of the book, Tell Me What Happened, uh, which was published by Wiley in 2008, I believe republished in 2018. So uh, when CPS does knock on your door, if you will, you have the right to have uh, cameras, obviously, uh, inside your home, outside your front door. Perhaps you have a ring camera, uh, you know, and uh, you'll see a badge around their neck. And obviously, this is uh, the government. Uh, it, it is the state. Uh, they work in loco parentis. Basically, the state as the parent. That's their mindset. Uh, their mindset also in uh, hearsay allegation cases uh, is uh, children don't lie and they're not mistaken about sexual assault. They must be believed to protect it at all costs. So they're going to believe the kid. Uh, I don't recommend you speak to uh, the police and or CPS without counsel present. Uh, if counsel is present, counsel will direct you what questions to ask, uh, uh, rather to answer uh, or not answer. <clears throat> and uh, there was a section uh, at my website, abuse-excuse.com, in my book, Elusive Innocence, Survive a Guy for the Falsely Accused, titled How to Choose Your Attorney. Um, as far as um, 
uh, documenting of CPS. Um, you know, you can uh, take their name, uh, what agency they belong to, perhaps get a badge number. If they have a badge number, like a police officer has a badge number, write it on a, a tabloid of paper, uh, you know, when they show up. Uh, if you do open the door, uh, if you have a body cam uh, turned on, uh, just like a police officer, they may or may not allow you to keep that body cam on or not. Okay, but I do recommend folks to uh, seek out and wear these body cams now because you need transparency, you need accountability. Now, <clears throat> if they do take, take your child, uh, the child uh, may go temporarily to foster care, uh, or if they have done some homework uh, ahead of time, uh, and again, this, this, this allegation may have come from a mandated reporter, teacher, uh, youth services worker, guidance counselor, therapist, uh, pediatrician at the hospital, uh, any mandated reporter who has to report any reasonable suspicion of child abuse. Uh, you know, you uh, you basically want to document. Uh, they they may or may not tell you how the uh, where they got the information from, who they got the information from, and they uh, they may not even articulate to you what the index allegations are. That is going to come later in a petition. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, you know, again, if you do allow them to talk to your child in your home, uh, they could ask leading, suggestive, direct, repeated, uh, forced choice, negative stereotype induction questions, questions that can contaminate and taint the child's information. And the child could implicate you in a bad private part touch or a hit, a smack, uh, a bite, a kick, whatever. Uh, you know, and and it could be a young, suggestible child. Uh, so this happens, and it happens more often than you could you could possibly imagine. Uh, uh, now, if it if, if they take the child, uh, like I said, in my state, uh, it's supposed to go to a shelter hearing within 24 hours. Uh, they will file a shelter petition. Uh, you will have counsel to answer that petition. There has to be an arraignment, which is basically like a criminal arraignment, but this is not criminal court. This is juvenile court where the rules of juvenile procedure uh, basically govern uh, what, what's going on with the case and the child and, and yourself, the accused. And the arraignment, you basically, uh, the lawyer is going to basically deny the allegations or the, or admit the allegations. And, and, and mind you, uh, there are malcontents out there. There are people who abuse children physically, sexually, uh, allow children to be witnesses to, to domestic violence. So this does happen. So this is two sides of the coin here. Okay, I'm giving you information, obviously, from the accused side, uh, because there aren't many people that do the work that I do and, and represent the accused as an expert uh, who goes up against CPS, who goes up against child forensic interviewers, uh, perhaps pediatricians, uh, although I cannot render medical opinions, I have uh, reviewed uh, hundreds of anal genital rape exam reports over the decades, uh, as, as well as uh, therapists, etc., uh, who I go up against in court. <clears throat> so the shelter petition can be followed by what's called a dependency petition. Okay, so by by definition, dependency is you're being accused of child abuse, child neglect, uh, and or child abandonment. Uh, and so uh, when you are served with a uh, dependency petition in my state of Florida, or it may be called in your state a China petition, child in need of assistance, or it might be called, if you're in Kansas, a SYNC petition, C-I-N-C, child in need of care, or maybe... Uh, it's a PINS petition or a CHINS petition, Child in Need of Services. Whatever the acronym is, you're being forced to juvenile court, okay? And in juvenile court, trumps family court. And so it's very, very serious. Uh, uh, CPS obviously wants a victory. Uh, you, if you've been false accused, you want a victory. It's not what you know. It's not what you think you know. It's what you can prove. Uh, in most of these juvenile court adjudicatory hearing proceedings, because it will go from a 
uh, shelter petition to a formal dependency or China petition or or or, or sink petition or seen a petition, uh, that'll be your day or days in court to go to a trial or hearing to basically prove your innocence, prove a negative. Uh, you know, welcome to my world. Uh, and I've been in this world now for the better part of three decades, back to the mid '90s. My website has been up on the internet since 1997. So uh, these are competent uh, lawyers who represent CPS. Obviously, they they uh, wield a lot of power. They're omnipotent, like uh, in court. A lot of judges are intimidated by CPS. So oftentimes, CPS, if this is a tennis match, has the advantage. You, the accused, do not. That's going to require even a more aggressive team of professionals to defuse this bomb, if you will, if you have been wrongly or falsely accused, uh, to, to basically get to victory. Uh, most of these cases are not false allegations. Uh, by false, I mean uh, an allegation that is made with malice aforethought, uh, that was made in bad faith, uh, with premeditation to hurt you, the accused. Uh, <clears throat> most of these cases are mistakes, uh, perhaps well-meaning, well-intentioned, uh, but misguided uh, professionals uh, who will conduct the investigation, uh, who might make an error or two, uh, <clears throat> or it could be, you know, when, when, the, when the report comes down, perhaps from a, a school counselor at the school, uh, the child had a, a conversation with that with that school counselor and said, my stepdad uh, was touching me. And then the school counselor started asking leading, suggestive, direct questions. And the child uh, was basically saying yes and yes and yes to the questions. And of course, the school counselor being a mandated reporter calls it in to the police uh, and or the toll free hotline number for abuse allegations. Uh, to the CPS agency, and the next thing you know, you're getting that knock on the door from Child Protective Services. So <clears throat> while the police uh, obviously live in the, uh, under the criminal rules of procedure, uh, where the evidence threshold is 95% beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal court, this uh, these are the juvenile rules of procedure. This is juvenile court, where the... Uh, the burden of proof is much lower. Uh, it, it dips from 95% down to 51% or a preponderance of evidence. Now, there are some states like Pennsylvania, I believe, where the evidence threshold is 75% clear and convincing evidence at the adjudicatory or evidentiary hearing or trial. That, again, is your day or days for the accused to prove a negative uh, innocence to introduce evidence, witness testimony, fact witnesses, uh, expert witnesses, exhibits to basically impeach the allegations against you. Uh, there was a provision where an attorney may uh, cajole you, the accused, to consent to dependency, again, to basically admit that you uh, made a mistake or you were wrong, you uh, committed a perhaps a lesser type of abuse, but you did commit abuse, perpetrate abuse, and uh, perhaps the judge will go easy on you, uh, where the child will come home after you sign a plan, case plan, uh, and you have to jump through the hoops of CPS. Now, there are two types of, case, uh, of plans, if you will. So at the initial stage, when CPS does knock on that door of your home uh, or business, <clears throat> Uh, there's a risk safety plan. I, I don't recommend you sign that, just like I don't recommend you talk to CPS without a lawyer present. Uh, in fact, in Iowa, these risk safety plans have been ruled unconstitutional. Uh, there was a 2014 case where a federal judge ruled CPS's uh, uh, execution of risk safety plans to be unconstitutional. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, those risk, risk safety plans uh, CPS, again, will get you to try to jump through a few hoops uh, to remedy what they believe are wrongs that you committed uh, in order to hold on to your child in the home uh, or get the child back. Uh, that's, a, that's a promise from CPS. I wouldn't want them to, uh, you know, I would want to contest them. I, I just, 
you know, you, you have to challenge uh, at every fork in the road because they're going to challenge you, the accused. I can assure you I get challenged all the time uh, in cases. You have to challenge them, uh, and, and I don't know that I would trust them. Okay, so uh, that's the first uh, plan or is a risk safety plan. The more uh, in-depth plan is called a case plan. And the case plan comes to fruition if you lose uh, at the dependency stage of litigation, uh, whether you lose at trial or whether you consent to dependency, either or, the judge will force you to sign that case plan. And uh, that basically gives CPS... uh, Uh, and the accused, uh, 15 to 22 months, 15 to 22 months time frame under the Adoption and Safe Families Act from 1997 for the accused to uh, substantially comply with that case plan, meaning you have to successfully jump through those hoops. Those hoops could contain a parenting uh, course, uh, a psychological evaluation, therapy. Uh, It could be in a sundry of, of, of tasks that the accused has to perform and do so successfully uh, to in order to meet the uh, threshold of substantially complying with that case plan. So because there are two judicial review hearings, there are judicial review hearings at the six month time frame uh, post dependency. So let's say you have your hearing coming up here in March of 2024, uh, but you lose uh, you basically have till March of 2025 uh, after two, two judicial review hearings, six months apart, to substantially comply. And if you did not do so by that time frame, uh, CPS has the right to file a petition for termination of parental rights. So they are escalating the case from dependency to what's called TPR. Uh, at that stage of litigation, they are required to uh, prove their case by clear and convincing evidence, okay? And so, therefore, uh, the burden of proof is a little higher for CPS at that stage, about 75%. But if they are successful, um, you know, then you have lost your parental rights and you have to appeal, and appeals are very expensive. Uh, You could obtain an attorney, perhaps at no cost, just like you could obtain an attorney for the dependency stage of litigation. You could obtain a... Uh, appellate attorney uh, under the rules of juvenile appellate law, uh, that's even more complex than at the dependency litigation stage. So uh, this is an agency that has independent agencies contracted. uh, They they contract to independent agencies to help them. Uh, So, for example, in my state of Florida, there's CPC, Community Partnership for Children, there's uh, Children's Home Society. There's the Family Builders uh, Organization. All these independent agencies can assist CPS in the investigation uh, and, if you will, prosecution of the case at a civil level uh, in, in juvenile court against the accused. The judge will also appoint a uh, guardian ad litem. Okay, this is an attorney who represents a child. Uh, if it's a case of alleged sexual assault, it could be uh, a guardian ad litem who, uh, just like the CPI, the child protective investigator, believes the child, uh, regardless of the accused saying, I wasn't there, I couldn't have been, I, I have an alibi, I wasn't there when the child says, uh, I allegedly touched the child. Uh, the GAL doesn't care about that, believes the child, the child could not be lying, could not be mistaken. And therefore, uh, that's a very, uh, that's a person who has a lot of weight with the court because that's a court fiduciary appointed directly by the court. These are called minors counsel in California, law guardians in New York and New Jersey. Uh, Basically, the lawyer representing the kid or the child. So now you're, now you're going up against not just CPS counsel, but the attorney for the child. Um, and then, of course, uh, if, if the parents are in a divorce or custody battle, each parent is going to have counsel. So you can imagine uh, how many lawyers are in the courtroom. Uh, there are a, a bunch of fact witnesses in the courtroom, uh, agencies, including, of course, the child protective investigator. 
and it becomes very overwhelming very quickly. All right, so uh, that basically uh, goes takes you through the litigation process. Uh, myself, uh, as an expert in uh, helping the attorney assist the accused, if you have been wrongly or falsely accused, my job is to help the lawyer intersect the uh, alleged facts and facts of the case with the science and the law. Usually, if you are successful in doing that in court, you will prevail. <clears throat> uh, there's not a lot of time between uh, when you're accused, you get that knock on the door, if you will, from CPS. It goes to court. It goes to the adju adjudicatory hearing, usually within 60 days uh, from the time you are accused. CPS in my state of Florida only has 60 days from the day of intake uh, and receipt of their allegation to investigate the same and close it out as verified or unverified findings. <clears throat> now, in a lot of states, uh, not named Florida, in addition to going through juvenile court, they can put your name on the child abuse registry. That is a black list of suspected abusers. If you are a professional who works around children, uh, a physician, a nurse, a therapist, uh, a teacher, a police officer, I can assure you, it will end your occupation in a New York minute unless you successfully uh, appeal uh, at a, what's called an administrative appeals hearing. That CPS uh, substantiated or founded or indicated classified, classified finding against you. Uh, you basically have one bite to legal app. So there'll be a, what, what, what's called an administrative appeals hearing in front of an ALJ, administrative law judge, uh, you may need the services of an expert uh, <clears throat> to testify uh, at that proceeding, uh, which the burden of proof is a preponderance of evidence, more evidence than not, 51%. So it's a very slippery slope. It's a very gray area. Uh, at the adjudicatory stage of litigation uh, in CPS cases, uh, in the administrative law appeal cases, uh, it's you know, the trier and finder of fact can make a mistake on the side of caution, uh, on the side of the child, not the side of the accused. <clears throat> so uh, in my practice, uh, I'm very uh, firm about uh, wanting the accused to go through testing uh, to help prove that negative, if you will, whether it's physical abuse, uh, physical child abuse, you, you should go through what's called the CAPI. Uh, child abuse potential inventory. Uh, if you go to the website par inc, p a r i n c dot com, and type in the search box "child abuse potential inventory," you'll get a hit on that. Dr. Joel Milner's CAPI test. That is our gold standard test to help uh, impeach uh, wrong, wrongful uh, physical child abuse cases. Uh, just one of the tests. We also have the adult, adolescent parenting inventory. Uh, for older children, uh, allegations on physical abuse cases. Um, and then, of course, if it's sexual assault, uh, the uh, gold standard test is called the ABLE Assessment for Sexual Interest, uh, also known as the ABLE Screen. And the website for that is ablescreening.com. That's A-B-E-L screening.com. This test has been out since 1996. We are assessing the accused level of sexual interest or arousal to uh, children, whether it's a prepubescent female child that you may have been accused of sexually abusing or perhaps a, uh, a tween, a nine to 12 year old child, or even a male child, uh, whatever the gender may be, we're assessing your level of sexual interest, arousal, gratification, attraction to that child. Uh, we're also assessing your level of cognitive distortions because we know that actual pedophiles will try to uh, justify uh, their actual abuse. In other words, they'll try to be con men uh, to hoodwink uh, the entire system as well as themselves and the family and, of course, the child that they actually abused. And they will score high on what's called the CD scale score, cognitive distortion scale score, uh, greater than 25%. So the uh, person who is uh, pretty much honest to a fault will score lower than 25% uh, 
down to perhaps uh, towards zero percent. I've had a few clients uh, test out at about two percent, basically honest to a fault. Uh, we also use a test called the MITSA, Multi-Dimensional Inventory Deve for Development, Sex, and Aggression, which also includes a uh, testing of one's cognitive distortions or justifications on whether you're trying to uh, beat the rap, if you will. So uh, this is a very uh, protracted process from the time you get that knock on the door to the time you go to court, to the time it's over. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Uh, if it resolved itself quickly, you're lucky. Uh, these cases are litigious. They are costly. Uh, you have a right to my services uh, if you don't have any resources. Uh, and you can prove through a financial affidavit you are indigent for costs. Uh, in law, what we call informa pauperis. You have a right, uh, uh, because you have a legal right to due process under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, uh, to have not just an attorney, but an expert or experts to help you uh, defeat uh, false allegations against you uh, in court, whether that's juvenile court and or criminal court. Uh, if, if this escalated and you got arrested, which of course you could, especially sexual abuse based on hearsay, um, <clears throat> then... Uh, you'd have a right uh, to my services as an expert. I have uh, six cases on my plate right now that I'm working uh, where the judge has ordered the state to pay my fees for my work and my time because the accused did not have the resources to retain my services. Uh, therefore, the state pays up. And uh, I am, uh, I've been with the OPDS, Office of Public Defense Services in Arizona, uh, for uh, well, since 2010, and the same time frame uh, in Florida with the what's called Justice Administrative Commission out of Tallahassee, our capital here in Florida. Uh, the website for that is justiceadmin.org. So uh, there I am titled a due process contract provider for lawyers uh, and the accused. Uh, and that includes cases if the accused doesn't have a lawyer and is litigating pro se. I don't recommend litigating pro se uh, against the state if you've been arrested and or against CPS and CPS counsel if they have taken your child. Obviously, uh, uh, your lawyer uh, is representing you know yourself, the accused, and also the child indirectly. Uh, even though the child may have a guardian ad litem, that guardian ad litem for all intents and purposes may be against you and against your legal position in court. Therefore, your lawyer is doing double duty uh, and has to be you know, that competent, that aggressive uh, in order for you to prevail in court. Remember, you're going up against that behemoth here in Child Protective Services. Uh, all 50 states uh, have Child Protective Services because, of course, children uh, are abused, uh, and it's a problem. Uh, what's also a problem are unsubstantiated allegations. We only see false allegations maybe 5% uh, to maybe 10% of the time. So this is more the exception than the rule is the false allegation. But the uh, unsubstantiated allegation, the unfounded allegation, the one that could not even uh, meet a legal burden of proof of a preponderance of evidence uh, is more the rule than the exception. So this is a problem. And you need attorneys who have an experienced track record in helping you in these situations. I want to thank you uh, for having me. And uh, I hope you all uh, uh, don't have that knock on the door. But if you do, uh, my website is uh, www.abuse-excuse.com. And uh, if you uh, need an attorney uh, against CPS, you certainly want to uh, look at the AVO ratings of that attorney. You may find a lawyer at lawyers.com or through word of mouth uh, <clears throat> from a lawyer you knew in the past or just online through Google or or maybe AI has that information now. 
but certainly you'd need an experienced uh, lawyer like you would in for criminal court or family court or uh, any other type of litigation. Uh, and that includes these administrative uh, law judge uh, hearings where you're going up against CPS. So you want to make sure you get an attorney who has been there, done that, uh, and is not foreign to this type of litigation. Thanks again. Next week, Dr. Steven Lindenberg talks about grief due to loss of grandchildren through estrangement or alienation.